Welcome to the Bay Area Book Festival's Birds in Your Backyard program. Uh, please, uh, well, I'm welcoming, I'm like, please welcome, welcome, uh, welcome everybody, welcome also all people attending virtually. I'm so glad everyone's here. Thank you for coming out on this windy day. Um, and uh, please make sure your cell phone volumes are turned down. Um, I'm Martina Satris. I'm the acquisitions editor at Heyday, uh, your longtime local publisher of books about California's history, nature, uh, social justice movements, and indigenous voices and cultural revitalization. Just we're down on San Pablo these days. Um, I'm going to be your moderator. Uh, and um, Alex Harris and Jack Gedney are both Heyday authors um, who uh, Alex's book came out last uh, August, and Jack's book comes out Tuesday. So this is his launch party, <laughs> and um, we're so excited for it. Um, the, uh, the books will be available for signing and sale at the East Wind uh, Books Tent down on Bookseller Boulevard. Um, we'll be walking over there right after the conversation today. Um, and. I might, I'll just ask you guys to introduce yourselves. Um, I'll just go kind of this way. Um, Alex, uh, will you tell folks a little bit about yourself and, and, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about the books, but just you, you the author artist man. Hello, is it on? Is it on? Is the mic? Okay. It is on. Just hold it closer. Okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Alex Harris. Um, I'm from Berkeley, California. Uh, <laughs> welcome if you're not. Um, yeah, I don't know. I got into painting birds a couple years back and uh, made a book about them. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain more about that. Hello, everyone. I'm Jack Gedney. Uh, I'm from Marin County, California, but I went to school here at UC Berkeley where I studied literature and natural history. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've been a co-owner and manager of Wild Birds Unlimited in Novato. Um, and this is my first book. Yeah, woohoo! Yeah, both, um, both of these gentlemen are debut authors. Um, I got to work with them and edit their books. Um, and so it's really a joy with the pandemic. We have not seen each other in person very much. So it's really nice to be here with you, both of you today. Um, uh, one of the things I really love about Heyday authors is the very many hats they all wear gracefully. And, um, you know, Alex has a background in um, environmental studies and uh, is also, uh, you know, a, a visual artist, as you may have seen if you've picked up Birds of Lake Merritt and seen his work. Um, and uh, I, I love that. And, and yeah, as Jack said, he studies literature, studies birds, studies trees as well. Um, he had a, a, a guide to, um, to the trees as well that he published before working with Heyday. Um, I thought it might be nice to give everyone a taste of their wonderful writing. Um, so I wanted to invite both of them uh, to read a passage. Um, Jack, if you will do us the honor of going first and introducing everyone to your wonderful book. I'd, I'd love that. So the passage I've chosen is from the chapter on Anna's Hummingbird, uh, and it is in honor of Mother's Day. There's a vital corollary to the incredible lengths to which male hummingbirds have developed their visual appeal. Their entire courtship is based on visual display. Their bond with the female is more transient than that of any bird in this book, and they do not contribute to nest construction, nest defense, or care of the young. The corollary to flamboyant but practically absent fathers is triumphant motherhood. I do not think the whole glory of hummingbirds consists of heads of molten metal or feats of airborne daring. I'd love to call my hummers Anna because it is the females I most love to watch. There are those of blazing red who burn brightly and depart. But there's also one of gray and green who nurtures and sustains. She sits on the loveliest of nests, a thing she built alone from down and spider silk until her chicks have hatched. She gathers all their food herself until her chicks have fledged. Then she immediately repeats the feat with all construction, incubation, and feeding performed without male help. Flight, song, and color are all remarkable things. But equal to all those flamboyant wonders is a nest, the epitome of non-flamboyance. Hummingbird nests are warmth and comfort, safety and security stitched from the slightest things. 
tufts of willow catkins and fuzz of sycamore leaves, sticky silk of spiders and cocoons, scraps of moss and lichen. Those wonders of displaying males obey an evolutionary imperative, be visible. But the wonders of female hummingbirds follow an opposite command, conceal the nest. Are flashing colors more beautiful than a perfect camouflage? Are dives and chases more to be admired than the endless patience of sitting still? For myself, I find that I, by temperament, invariably incline toward the quiet and the faithful rather than the brilliant and the boastful. I do not think a labor is more worthy for being widely seen. I think an artwork is most perfect when it fills a private need. And there's no more work more private than a nest, art made to be concealed. She approaches with no announcement and no glitter. There are only a handful of stars upon her throat, and the male's noise and fury are far off and forgotten. She bears another scrap of lichen to disguise the nest as just a part of the well-weathered branch on which it sits. And when I see that gray-green ghost perform her often unseen labor, I catch my breath at something precious in that silent, private moment. Secrets are seldom told out loud. But if you listen, and you watch, and you hold back from over-quick conclusions, then you may hear their whispers. The lives of birds are like their nests, hidden in plain sight to those whose minds are elsewhere. If you would be their secret sharer, then you must bring something with you to the trees. No tools or even knowledge suffice to part the curtain. There is a little cup of down and silk hidden in the leaves. The light that shows its presence is nothing else but quiet patience. That is a wonderful gift to mothers everywhere. I found myself nodding yes. <laughs> Unseen labor. Um, uh, Alex, you have uh, visited some spectacular birds of Lake Merritt um, in your book. Can you share one of them with us? Uh, sure. This is the uh, section about a bird called the American Coot. Another year-round Lake Merritt resident is the American Coot. These birds, the size of a large cantaloupe, feed mostly by dabbling or pecking at aquatic plants and algae, sometimes diving into the shallow water to get at tasty bits below the surface. They're almost entirely a dull, faded black color with a white bill and red eyes. Despite being one of the most common birds at Lake Merritt, the American coot is easy to overlook. From afar, an uninterested party might see them floating about and assume they are just ducks. They are actually a species of rail, not even related to ducks. It is not until you see them on land that the common American coot becomes uncommonly interesting. Watching birds at Lake Merritt, you can get so close to such a wide variety of wild birds that you're able to make out minute details you might otherwise only see in a photograph. And getting close to the American coot is necessary to marvel at it, in particular at its lower limbs. A coot's feet and legs do not look as though they should be attached to their drab bodies. It's as if something got messed up at the bird assembly factory, where some chickens accidentally got outfitted with state-of-the-art aquatic bird foot technology. Their long legs extend out of their lackluster plumage, often in some shade of green, gray, blue, yellow, or orange. The colors move towards the yellow-red spectrum as the birds age. Their legs then flare out into three wide, flat toes with two to four distinct lobes each. Each lobe has a radial gradation of vibrant colors overlaid by a black nodular mesh. This lobed look, aside from being fancy, helps the coot scoot through the water as well as navigate various earthly terrains and is even used like a snowshoe to cross the mucky mires on which they sometimes tread. Thank you. So um, I, I'm going to invite our, our authors to engage in conversation with each other, but I also have some questions. Um, uh, Jack, one of the things when we were talking about the, when we were in the conversation about the title, uh, one of the titles that, that we thought about internally was just How to Love Birds, because that's what your book teaches us, I think. Um, there were many other suggestions. <laughs> um, but I, one of the things that I, I so um, adore about your work is how you bring literature, Whitman and Jeffers and Neruda in. Um, and I wondered for you, in terms of how you've come to love birds and are helping us to love it, how has literature brought you into relationship um, with the birds? Great, thank, thank you, Martina. Um, 
I think my perspective, it is kind of a trait of my book that is a little different than the typical, that my first background with nature was more literarily mediated. Um, I read just a lot <laughs> as, as a kid, um, in addition to the formal studies in literature, and I think some of my formative influences on how I later came to think about the natural world were through books. From when I was very young and just reading stories of adventures in the outdoors, things like Hatchet or My Side of the Mountain, or uh, things like Tolkien, uh, I think had a big shaping on that sense of both magical potential in the world and how uh, things like birds and trees were fit subjects for poetry and wonder, um, were ideas that I carried with me then when I came to look at birds um, in person as a, as, a, as a hobby, as through my business. Um, and so when I came to write the book, that continued to be a lens in how I shape things uh, and viewing thing, the world of birds not just in the more practical day-to-day -day terms, but as still having that potential for poetry even in the most common places. Well, I love that. I've just been, we just finished reading all of Lord of the Rings to my five, now six-year-old. So I'm, I'm glad I'm giving him a leg up on that. Um, and similarly, Alex, I live walking distance to Lake Merritt, and I did not love it until I read your book. And um, I grew up in West Marin, and so my, I grew up on Bolinas Lagoon. It's a very different waterway. Um, but like you said, you can get so close to the birds. Um, you're, one of the things about Alex's book is it introduces you to the environmental history of the lake as a, as a place that's shared by humans and wild things. Um, I wondered for you how you did research and writing about the lake and its birds affect your vision of, of that place um, and, and how you relate to it? Got to formulate the answer. Um, how, did it, how did researching it change how I viewed it? Mm -hmm. well, if it I, did. I knew a lot more about it, mm -hmm. um, which helps. <laughs> um, I think I was maybe in your, I mean, before I wrote my book, I didn't know that much about Lake Merritt, except I would jog around it or whatever, go eat burritos uh, at it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, just, you know, I think with any, you know, and gaining any depth of knowledge on anything increases appreciation for it, which is sort of why I made this book and started painting birds in the first place is just focusing on something and then, you know, familiarity breeds uh, not contempt. <laughs> is that the same? <laughs> I, I agree. I think that's a good point. Um, one of the things you talk about is that it is a, a very, you know, you talk about the human shaping of it. Um, and does that, sometimes now when I look at the lake, I see both what was there and what is there now? Um, do you have that experience ever? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, growing up or living in such a human impacted place, it's, you know, it's nice to kind of be able to see uh, both layers of existence that are kind of on top of each other, both the sort of natural geographical world that is around us and then what humans have done to it. And in being able to see both, you can kind of see this third thing that emerges from it, which is, for better or worse, the thing that we all kind of are gonna have to figure out how to navigate and live within, and hopefully share with uh, non-human people. Um, that's something I think is really true in both your books, is, is thinking about how we live in relationship in a place um, that is an altered landscape. Um, and you both find possibility in that. Um, for you, Jack, when you um, started looking at birds around you, I, there's a passage, let's see, I marked it, but let's see if I can find it real fast. It's one of my favorites. I mean, there's so many favorites. I went on a fine adventure yesterday, writes Jack Gedney in his chapter on uh, the linnet. I went on a fine adventure yesterday across the parking lot between the cars, past the chain coffee shop and shoe store to the, my, to the mailbox, which was full of ads and bills but I stepped out of my doorway and saw a nest where a shy brown head peeked out. I walked across the pavement and saw four red scars flying across an unhurt sky. 
and on the roof in neon signs, in the lattice with tired paint, and in the shallow planted trees from a dozen different points across that sea of asphalt and machines, I heard the warbles rising in unrestrained delight. Um, so I wondered for you, why look for nature in the city? What, what about it is meaningful for you to find those birds? Uh, I think that you can find nature everywhere. And so that uh, passage was describing a scene from the renowned Bay Area Wildlife Refuge known as the Vintage Oaks Shopping Center of Nevada, California. <laughs> and it's true that even in a place where the surface is paved, the trees are just ornamentals planted 10 years ago, that people will still find that wildlife continuing. And so every day, this is right outside of my store, where people come in every day and they say, what are those birds outside? And they say they've never seen those little yellow birds, the goldfinches, or that they've never seen the house finches who are nesting right outside the door. And there is that same potential for seeing something new, whether you're in a wild forest setting or whether you're right at home in a, in a town or urbanized area. And I think that it's many of the core things are just as accessible there. Many of the basics of birds, which I talk about, things like nesting or migration or why they've evolved the songs and colors that they have, all of those things are on display with birds in suburbanized or urbanized areas just as much as they are in the wild. Yeah, do you think, Alex, um, that there's been a change in how you think about like this place that you grew up, the city you grew up, um, from connecting with the birds through your artwork and this book? Yeah, and I mean, definitely in that I like think about it at all yeah. um, has changed it. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think uh, sort of in that vein, there's some negative and some positive that comes up to me about it where it's like, yeah, there's nature everywhere and as we can see, you know, at Lake Merritt, for instance, there you can see a pretty wide range of, or even just outside your door, um, uh, a wide range of birds, and they're doing all their bird behaviors, and they're fully being birds. And so it's not like we've lost that necessarily. But then also, um, you know, in researching the history of Lake Merritt and how it just sort of, like, kind of by happenstance became a, or by some, you know, rich guy's whim randomly because he wanted his real estate prices to go up or whatever, it became a bird sanctuary and how sort of fleeting some of these protections can be and how they're not, uh, there's not nearly as many as there should be and they're fleeting and, you know, it's not guaranteed at all. So it's kind of like there is the beauty, but then you also can sense the fragility of it. Um. I think that's such an interesting point and and reminds us that we have that the more that we can connect with it and the more we kind of understand the layers of appreciating loving what's there and then learning about it like you said the more there is perhaps to to do <laughs> on their behalf and on our own um one of the things that um I really again enjoy about both your books is that you are, you are in in dialogue um with others um, Jack in particular with um, the writers uh, who have been so informative to you and and Alex you brought in the voices of folks from from Oakland um, can you talk about um, why you decided to bring the voices of, of local folks into the birds of Lake Merritt um, well a variety of reasons I think uh, Going into this, I, I, and I still don't necessarily view myself as much of an expert on any of this, and so I think there was some sort of like uh, trying to lean on other people's expertise a little bit, um, which is, I, and, and so that's, that's one way of putting it, and another way of putting it is uh, making sure that my story that I'm telling includes a variety of viewpoints, because I just have one very specific viewpoint, and I think it's more interesting to uh, open it up and see what other people think, especially people who have been thinking about it for a lot longer than I have um, and have really, you know, spent their lives on these issues. So why not try to get them in? And it, you know, fills up pages and this kind of thing as well. That's a couple pages knocked out pretty easily. 
This is, you're getting the inside scoop on the authorial process here. And Jack, you're in dialogue with folks every day at your store. I was curious um, what kinds of conversations you've been having. I know there's been a real uptick in people engaging with birds um, in the last couple of years. And I wondered um, what you've, yeah, what, what kind of conversations you're having these days? Are they different than they used to be? Or what are you seeing? I think the conversations are, are broadly similar to what they have been, but there's more of them, which is, is nice to see and encouraging. So my day-to-day -day work is about um, helping people attract birds to their yard. And sometimes they'll want to know what they want can attract or how to attract certain birds, or they want to know how to not attract other things, whether it's larger birds or squirrels or whatever. And what's interesting about those conversations and what shaped the book is how there's a lot that people, everyday normal people, don't know about birds that a lot of bird books might skip over because the authors are experts and are in dialogue with experts on a daily basis. While I like to think that I'm more in dialogue with everyday people who don't have this background in birds but still have that potential to enjoy them and appreciate a lot about them. And sometimes it's good to just focus on the fundamental things subjects, the big, broad, big picture bird subjects, like nesting, plumage, song, migration. What also um, comes up through this perspective is some sense of what I think drives appreciation most is familiarity, as Alex was saying. And that's another kind of pitfall that I feel a lot of bird books fall into is, or birders fall into, is the constant chasing after novelty and new things like the exotic, the rare. Instead, I think, for instance, one of the birds that I talk about people a lot with, that people enjoy a lot, is the California towhee, which is this very plain brown bird. It's the dullest possible bird. It doesn't have a musical song. But what is notable about it is that they're in almost every yard. Um, they are famous for things like pecking at windows when they see their own reflection, for wandering into people's houses uh, when the door is left open, and for their permanence of their pair bond, which you can see just as a uh, omnipresent thing, how the two male and female birds are forging constantly together and communicating with each other. And all of those kinds of behaviors are things that people see every day in their backyard and which don't always make it into the high esteem of uh, birders and their conversations. And um, Jack, does an amazing job in uh, his book of really addressing the the calls and songs of the birds. Um, as as so many of us might know, you hear them a lot more than you see them, um, and so getting to know them through their song has I think is I think a, a an incredible skill that Jack um, helps you achieve in his book. Um, the California Toey, I will never forget it. He describes it as sounding like a dying smoke alarm which it does, and at 3 a.m. I heard a dying smoke alarm this morning, and that was not confusing it for a towie, but, um, but I, it, it truly is an accurate description and um, is so helpful, and, and I also love the, 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 the rusty bum, uh, other ID aspect of it that is you, so much, so many times birds are above you, so you can just see what's underneath. Um, uh, can I comment on that? So uh, I until a couple weeks ago when I read that chapter in your book. Uh, I didn't know what that bird was. I only know 15 birds, and they're in this book. <laughs> and so I learned that one, and it, I, I've seen it forever, and I've always been like, oh, you know, that's just like a brown bird that's over there or whatever. And immediately upon reading your description of it, I just, it just like snapped in, and I was like, oh, I know that's what that bird is. Here's its deal. And now, and I've ID'd one, you know, 20 times since then because they're everywhere and I just thought that was really great and uh, I haven't finished all of your book because I want to take it like one chapter at a time and uh, sit with each bird you know learn a bird and then I like to try to focus on that one because my brain can't hold them all at once so I, I'll learn one and look for it and uh, yeah I, I, I appreciated that chapter very much. Jack was was your musical background part of what attuned you to bird song and understanding it? That's a very interesting question. Um, it comes up sometimes directly in the chapter on the morning doves and I think a little bit on the golden crowned sparrow. There are some birds whose songs follow 
uh, transcribable musical patterns based on certain intervals. And that is one source of their resonance, I think, in human minds, that there is some universality in the basic physics of what musical intervals we, we find um, consonant and harmonious. I've also had people ask me whether foreign language background affects how people listen to birds, and I think that's another interesting question. I think they all uh, combine, where what's interesting about listening to birds is that it it melds different ways of listening. There's both just awareness, which has uh, just kind of a mindfulness um, aspect to it. There is the musical part, where you can view it as an aesthetic phenomenon. There's the natural history part, where you can try and delve into what are the different purposes and functions filled by different species through their songs and calls. And I try and take as, as broad a view of it as possible and not limit it to just one or the other of those, those, those domains and try to bring together the science and the traditionally more humanistic fields. I, I think that's, that's what made it such a heyday book in my mind, is that blend. Um, and as well, one of the things we love at Heyday, as you guys probably know, are, is um, the visual artist's view, viewpoint and that mindfulness that comes through both attending to the bird and also to the, the work of, of interpreting it for the page. Um, so Alex, I know you wanted to both improve your knowledge of birds and painting through painting these birds. It was a very practical um, approach. What, what did you notice about yourself as an artist um, about painting these birds? Did, were there any challenges or any particular delights? Uh, gouache is easier than watercolor. That's one thing I learned. <laughs> um, that was a delight to learn. Um, I don't know. I, I think that um, pre previous to uh, doing sort of bird and, and natural painting, I, I mean, I, I didn't, didn't really have much of an art career to speak of before that, but it was always, I would always try and like think of interesting things to paint, compositions or, you know, whether it's abstract compositions or whatever, and <clears throat> switching uh, to something that's just you know, that I'm just directly trying to replicate, essentially, was in some ways, you know, it feels limiting in a sense. You're not necessarily using as much of, you know, creativity and, you know, imagination and whatever. Um, there is still some of that, but uh, it was it was very almost therapeutic just to not worry about any of that and just be like, let me just try to paint this thing um, and focus on the painting and the color and not and not get caught up in, you know, what does it mean? What am I representing? What am I trying to say here? Um, so that was very nice, and I, I, I appreciated that aspect of it, and clearly st stuck with it. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, since you finished the book, um, I know we, we had a little lunch near Walden Pond and, and then went over and found out that his book has been one of their bestsellers um, since it came out, which is, was a delightful uh, thing to learn. Um, anyways, but, uh, what have you been painting since since wrapping up your 15 birds? I painted a fried chicken sandwich, <laughs> most recently. Still bird related. And, yeah. Um, other than that, I did a oyster catcher at one point. Um, I haven't really been painting. Uh, yeah. Um, what have you been doing? <laughs> Just get busy, Alex. Yeah, have, this is only the fir the first book. You don't yeah. have everyone has more than one book in them, right? I'm, I'm saving my uh, painting strength. I'm <laughs> gathering my energy. <laughs> um, you know, we're all local to the Bay Area. I grew up here, and Alex did, and and Jack has been in and out. I'll have to learn more about that story, but you were drawn back. Um, so I wondered, you know, in terms of engaging with the local, um, Jack, as we've talked about, I know Thoreau is a touchstone for you at that point. Um, what has having a relationship with the birds helped you understand this place, or did you feel like the relationship with, with the place kind of was, was, in, was in place first? I think the birds definitely help people to have a sense of place, and that's one of the core themes that I return to over and over in the book. Even when I do pull in uh, authors from outside the region. Like one of my favorite Thoreauvianisms is when he says, I've traveled a good deal in Concord. <laughs> um, the idea that 
you don't need to voyage wide, far and wide to have new experiences, where he talks about how he can go out for a walk on any given day and just within the radius of a day's walk find something new that he's never seen before. And that is a, a great, birds are a great entryway to knowing your place in that way. Uh, I live now in, in Novato, uh, the northernmost town in Marin County, and birds were one of the means in which you can explore all the different plant communities and habitats. Part of what's wonderful about the Bay Area is how everything is so diverse within a very small space, where just within a day's walk or bike ride, I can go from salt marsh to grassland to mixed evergreen forest, oak savanna, and see it all. And the birds are one of the clearest and most notable ways of kind of tying together those different natural communities into a coherent story in your mind, into having those places be not just a park, a preserve, a state park I went to, and said having them all take on distinct identities that you know of and can be touchstones for how you see the whole Bay Area. Has that been true for you too? Repeat the question. Have, have, have birds, have, have knowing the birds of Lake Merritt in particular, um, been a way that helped you connect more deeply with place or did you feel like you already were strongly rooted in place and as um, Jack has said you know that you have kind of this it's almost like a fractal aspect of like you there's no you can never fully know a place because it's always changing and your relationship to it is always changing but I wanted to know if the birds had played a role in that for you at all uh, yeah I mean definitely um, just knowing the birds around you contributes greatly to your understanding just like, I mean, pick anything, knowing the, you know, types of trees or whatever, you know, just any the kinds of cars, you know, whatever it is that's different from somewhere else yeah. will sort of create the, the flavor of that place. Um, another thing that I think was interesting for me in that regard was, aside from learning the birds, was the process of learning the birds, which involved going to one place over and over again and uh, just, seeing how it feels to be at that place over time and in different seasons and uh, what's around the place. And as I said earlier, you know, Lake Merritt was sort of just initially a place to jog or whatever before I got uh, involved in all this. And now it's many things. Um, and so that, uh, yeah, has greatly influenced how I feel about it and, the, you know, emanating out from it. Something else I think that's true of both my book and Alex's and a lot of what Heyday is, is all about is uh, the celebration of California as, as a whole and in its spe more specific communities. So in a lot of the birds I talk about, for instance, I would choose more California-specific um, species such as lesser goldfinch, so-called, rather than the more widespread American goldfinch, um, California scrub jay, California towhee, and how the traits that make them unique are part of what draws our interest to them. The, not that they're necessarily objectively more beautiful um, in some way than a more widespread or Eastern counterpart, but that they are unique to us and that there's something we can know as part of our own identity. And what one of the birds that stood out to me in Alex's book is the cover bird, the black crowned night heron, which is been really wonderful to see how it's taken um, kind of capture the imagination, become the official bird of Oakland, and how you see now like the elementary school kids get excited about it and how it's on the library cards and things like that, and how uh, just things that are a little different or quirky or strange in some way can uh, earn that affection of a place and community and become tied to it in people's mind. That's, that's really such a, I think those are, those are really helpful for thinking about that, thank you. Um, uh, you guys both uh, mentioned seasons and migrations, and it is going to be World Migratory Bird Day this coming weekend. We're in the middle of spring migration right now. Are there birds that you're looking forward to seeing um, who, are, who come through and visit um, the Bay Area at the, around this time of year? Yeah, the spring is, is one of the most exciting times, in part because of uh, bird, bird song and nesting activity going on now, in part because of migration. Right now we are in the thick of it, or kind of in the later stage, which is when you can see some, some less common things going through. And there are migration hotspots that birders will go to at a point raise or something. But 
I also just really enjoy going out to the woods, the local communities, where in addition to all the normal things, you never know what will pop up. So um, that was the perfect time for migratory warblers. So I saw a hermit warbler and a black-throated gray warbler in places where most of the year they won't be, but then you can just go out and see them this time of year. But for more summer birds that stay here, uh, Orioles are, are kind of the big story in, in backyards. And Hooded Oriole is one in, in my book that always grabs my attention that I look forward to seeing each spring. Are there any ducks coming through to your knowledge, Alex, that are, you're going to be looking forward to? Um, well, I think that the ducks are gone or leaving, as far as I know. Um, I think they're mostly here in the winter and by now are probably starting to go back up north uh, for the warmer season so and I, I guess to also call this back to the previous question the um the sense of migration uh in terms of knowing a place and knowing the cycle of time in a place for me is particularly helpful because my perception of time is not good i don't know how much time has passed or how long anything has been since anything has happened ever um <laughs> And this is something that I've been able to sort of start to hang my hat on a little bit, like getting a sense of like, oh, like this is, and having something to kind of like feel about how long has passed rather than just, you know, like it was Christmas a while ago and that's coming up again at some point or whatever. You know, it's like something that you can kind of pay attention to over time. It's like a clock, all, like, you know, looking at your watch, except it's, you know, how many ducks are on the lake or whatever. Um. I also I, I wanted to invite you guys if you have if you had questions for each other um, you know uh, uh, about the birds or about the writing process um, I'd love to just make sure that you guys get a chance to ask those of each other. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how the the painting experience shapes how you see the birds and what it draws your attention to. I was talking with my girlfriend, who's also an artist, about how she drew birds, and she was drawing this cormorant, and she was telling me, I said, no, every spot where it's dry and where it's mucusy and what all the tiny little aspects of anatomy are that I feel I often miss out on from my perspective. Do you feel like when you're looking at the birds that you've painted now that you have a, a more vivid picture of all those kinds of tiny little details that are often invisible to, to normal people? Yeah, for sure. Not that you're ab abnormal. <laughs> Um, definitely, and I think that in my case, it's not even the details, it's like the basic, the basics, um, you know, coming into it not really knowing much about birds and then, you know, painting 10 different kinds of ducks or whatever and just getting a sense like, okay, like, these ones have like this color head or whatever, like, for me, very simple, basic details. And now when I see these birds that I've, you know, spent 15 hours trying to recreate or whatever, it kind of like snaps to a picture in my mind. It's like, oh, and then I know what it is. And then that brings up, um, you know, what I've learned about it. So it's really my entry point into, uh, maybe that's just like visual learning or something um, versus re just reading about it or whatever. Um, and in, in doing really slow, painstaking paintings, I'm forced to kind of like study it over and over again. Um, so that's been sort of my, my way, as I set out to do, to sort of trick myself into learning about what these birds are. Do you think that is uh, because the painting process has really uh, unique virtues as a way of learning? Or do you think it's more tailored to the just different people at different ways that are most resonant? Or did you find that it was one component of your learning, but that talking with people directly or reading like what was the overall balance of learning about the birds for you did you say the painting was the most important part oh i i think it was the most important in that it was the entryway um and you know in also in doing the book then you know my first of all my curiosity gets uh you know peaked and i want to learn about these birds that i'm painting um so that kind of like gives me an impetus to go read on you know birds of the world dot org or whatever um and you know figure out like oh like who are they? Why are they here? What's their deal? Why is there, you know, you know, whatever? Why do they swim so low in the ground? Okay, so another component then is 
in learning to in in painting the birds and therefore learning what they are and then observing them at the lake then you can see them do behaviors uh which then make me want to know you know if it's just like abstract like i'm not going to be like why do robins do whatever but like if i'm observe if i know what it is and i'm observing it then that gets me wanting to know why it's doing these behaviors so that's kind of like maybe the trajectory of the sort of curiosity yeah, the uh, egret foot shake in the mud. I love learning about that. Very fun. Yeah. Um, for you, I know you said you're you're working through Jack's book. Um, as you have been going through and learning the birds, um, did you did anything come up? Like you have you have the man in front of you. Do you, do you have any questions? <laughs> this is the opportunity. Mm. <laughs> oh, I guess um, one maybe rudimentary question is of of there's many birds common birds around us every day. How did you hone in on the ones that you honed in on? Because there's some that I kind of see, um, you know, like crows and pigeons that are, I feel like talked about a lot as being like our bird friends, but the, uh, you know, scrub jays and towies or towies um, aren't necessarily always on the, you know, the top of the common list or whatever. I wrote about the ones that I liked the most. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it is, I did try to be representative of what people would see commonly in California. Some of them are California specialties, like the California scrub jay, California towhee, lesser goldfinch. Some are very, very broad spread across the continent, like morning doves or robins. Um, some are a little less common, like hooded orioles or cedar waxwings. I, I could have found more common birds, but uh, I tried to get a a representative sample across the spectrum of what is still possible for normal everyday people to see but still have some of the somewhat more exciting and interesting species in there and sometimes there are birds that just you, I can't seem to find anything to say about juncos or bluebirds even though it's, it seems like they should get plenty of, of attraction um, but yeah I tried to aim for common representative of California and then what I want to talk about <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll uh, kind of wrap things up with just one final question, but um, you know, one of the things that, um, there are some birds that have been perhaps underappreciated and that uh, are having a, a reputation improvement campaign in these books. Um, uh, Alex, I know we, we talked about that with the Canada geese. <laughs> and then um, Jack, I, I, I think looking particularly at raptors, raptors and the scrub jay perhaps, um, you're, you're trying to I think um, help help people understand them and appreciate them um, for for what they do and what they are. Um, so I was just curious for you, um, yeah, just if you if you uh, have new thoughts about geese now, and um, and yeah, and what uh, what it's like to to appreciate a bird that is not um, so widely appreciated. Um, well, I think. Initially, it might have been through the editing process with you. I think initially when I was writing the Canada geese chapter, I was taking kind of a more um, uh, sort of jokingly mean tone is what maybe what I would call it. Um, like like, like well-intentioned. Uh, ribbing. Yeah, ribbing, yeah. but from love. <laughs> um, from, from, <laughs> um, and uh, it might have been some edits of yours, comments of yours that were kind of like, some, someone I talked to, I don't know who else I, I talked think we, to about we did other talk than you. About it a little yeah, bit. yeah, that was kind of like, you know, go easy on these guys. Like they're, they're just doing their thing or whatever. And that, that kind of re, uh, not that I, you know, I was already appreciative of them. I was just taking a mean tone and I was like, they already have a bad rap. You know, maybe I don't need to uh, go in on them so hard. And um, so then started to try and look for all the things that were more um, positive about them and uh, find find the the good way the beneficial way of thinking about it or whatever. Um, and I think that was helpful because it you know that it did recast the narrative of like these are just these funny you know loud annoying birds like that's the that's the old trope and that's um, maybe getting worn out and. They're just, you know, out there trying to 
hang out at the lake like all of us, and just because they have more friends than I do doesn't mean I need to like, you know, be envious of them or jealous or whatever. Um, yeah, so it, it was great in that oh, regard. Good. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a learning process for me too, because uh, as you say, it's a bird, bird watching with geese is at Lake Merritt is an immersive experience. Um, and and yeah, Jack, I know a little bit with the scrub jay and the raptor, you kind of went on an intentional kind of like, especially wor working with Jeffers as a inter kind of locator, um, finding the beauty in their in their strength and in their um, intelligence. Um, yeah, it's an interesting contrast how what I found the more and more I think about it, um, these birds, is how many of the things that make some people uh, like them less are the same things that make other people like them more, and how much our judgment overall is based on relatively surface level differences, while when people delve a little deeper, they, they can broaden their um, Minds a little just to these particular birds. So scrub jays are often thought of uh, as bullies, or they're, people will worry about them eating the eggs and nestlings of smaller songbirds. Similar with hawks, people just are, are unhappy when they see a hawk catch a bird, for instance, from their bird feeders in their yard. People worry about vultures and find the whole idea of eating dead animals uh, unappealing. Or sometimes it's something a little more mundane, like people will think California towies are boring. Um, but all of those things I find in trying to explore in the book how they have a flip side, where the vultures service is extremely ecologically important, and the way they achieve it is through some incredible senses, like their sense of smell is far more acute than any other bird we have. Or how scrub jays, uh, even though they're a little larger, that opens up the potential for them to fill lots of other ecological roles, like planting acorns and how they're the main architects for our oak woodland. With red-tailed hawks, people admire hawks' beauty and grace and power. With California towhees, that plainness uh, is a key part of what enables them to be so unfurtive and open and familiar to us. And so I think in every case, when people start asking about why the bird lives this way rather than just taking it at that surface level and passing judgment on it, and the more they explore how that fits into their whole ecological role, it can be an avenue to understanding that bigger picture and, and finding something to appreciate about the birds. Well, I know my, my world has opened up through these books. Um, I was saying I, we both, Alex and I were talking about the mockingbirds that are now very much in our lives after reading your chapter. Um, and uh, yeah, just I, I've, I've come to appreciate Lake Merritt as a place where the wild and the human intersect um, in a, a really rich way from, from reading both the, the introduction and then each of the bird profiles in your book, Alex. Um, I'd love to invite folks to ask some questions. Um, I know we've got a, a microphone because we've got um, our virtual uh, attendees as well. Um, so uh, if I see hands, I can, um, if, if we can do in front and then, and then you, John. Oh, mine is, um, what is with all the blackbirds? In the last five years, they've just increased immeasurably and, and it seems like they're the only birds in my neighborhood I see. Um, You're saying like, like blackbirds, like the red the winged crows, blackbirds? Like the crows. crows? Yeah. Crows. All right, what is it with all the crows? <laughs> Overall, crows are one of the birds that have done really well with people over the last several decades. Um, they're generalists that are able to adapt to, to overlap with humans, um, both in terms of their food sources. They can often take advantage of what we leave behind directly. A lot of times we've planted trees in areas that formerly didn't have them, opening up nesting sites. It's a broad trend. Uh, I don't know that it's particularly accelerated in recent years. There can also be um, local movements and conglomerations where people who have crows will often get a lot um, if they are near a communal roosting site. So outside of the nesting season, uh, all the crows will, will gather in, in very large flocks in winter for sleeping. Even during the nesting season in more urbanized areas, the young crows will often form form flocks before they go off and form their own pairs. It's true that they're one of the more most common urban birds and that they can conglomerate and seem even more numerous, but um, in many respects, that's a, a story of how adaptable they are and how 
they have that um, intelligence and availability to move into places that humans have created that are more amenable to them than places where we are not. And that's kind of a nice thing, that there's a bird that, that likes what we've done with, with the world, while others find it, it less appealing to them. Yeah, I love you talk about, we built cities for crows without intending to. And I'll, I'll say that Jack's book has a very rich, informative chapter all about this. So there's more where that came from. I'm only partway through it, but <laughs> it's, it's rich. It's, it's obvious that um, there's an increasing interest in bird birds and birding in our culture. I don't know if it's a Berkeley phenomenon. I don't know if it's a national phenomenon. So that's one question. Is, it, is this a local thing or is this a bigger thing? And what is the relationship between this uptick in interest with the pandemic? Because my theory would be that we're more interested in the natural world because the human social world has shut down and that the birding interest may be parallel with that Inver an inverse parallel with that phenomenon. That's my question. Well, um, I, w I would invite Alex to maybe answer that as someone who's coming, f well, first, and then Jack, but, um, but just to, because, you know, one of the people who, um, uh, who blurbed your book was Jenny O'Dell, who has, has kind of charted, charted a little bit in How to Do Nothing, a little bit of the rise of a different kind of birding among, you know, the millennial set. Um, so I wondered if that is something that has been chatted about, if you've seen a shift in that in your own um, social group. Yeah, um, I, I mean, to, I guess, touch on the pandemic thing, um, I think that the sense I got was every, when everyone was basically trapped in their house, you're sort of stuck looking out your window and you start paying a lot more attention to whatever's there. Um, and I'm sure that business was booming in the uh, bird feeder. We ran out of sunflower repeatedly, yes. Yeah, I can imagine. So people are looking, you know, people started doing gardening at home, people started bird watching at home, um, and then that has expanded from there. Um, and I think also maybe more sort of broader, uh, and I don't, I don't know if I just made this up or not, but one sense that I get is that like, as um, you know, we're sort of going through a little bit of uh, ecological collapse decline kind of situation, um, there is sort of a renewal of interest in paying attention to what is there and what we have and either what we've lost or what we can still save and what the ramifications of our actions are in that regard. So um, I think it was kind of maybe a, a multi, multi-pronged thing that led to a, uh, a uh, increase in interest. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure, Jack, you probably have numbers that, <laughs> that back this up. Yeah, it's um, I have a little bit of a broader sample size um, since our store is part of a nationwide franchise. And it's, it's not just a local phenomenon. It is across the whole country that during the pandemic, a lot more people took up uh, hobbies around watching birds and attracting them to their backyard. And that is a, a bit of a silver lining and particularly the vein of watching birds that I am particularly encouraging of, that sense of place and sense of appreciation for what's around you, where birders aren't necessarily, where people don't have to be very adventurous, high-octane birders traveling around the world to add new species to their life list, but just the kind of everyday people and families looking out in their yard and learning the birds around them that previously they were too busy going, going elsewhere to stop and look at. And to touch on what Alex was, was saying at the end, I'm also hopeful that this kind of awareness, that people are able to connect to broader ecological issues with this foregrounding of the, the real life nature that they see every day and that that adds a vein of hopefulness and awareness and context to those discussions where both of our, our books, even though we're both aware of changes that um, humans have caused on uh, natural communities and how there are many, many issues facing birds today, that both of our books are still in a hopeful place and that we try to be optimist about many of these things and see 
uh, many of the, the good things that are still out there for the birds and for people to explore. And how our, how our and the birds' interests can be combined and united towards that. Uh, how what can, what, what's good for us can also be good for them and we can all hopefully benefit together. Are there any, yes, question up in the back. Oh, hi, I have a question for um, one for Alex and one for Jack. First for Alex, I'm wondering, since you spent a lot of time at Lake Merritt, if uh, uh, painting and observing birds, if you have an interesting story, you know, of something that happened to you, some experience that you happened at Lake Merritt, you know, with the, the urban natural interface, uh, if, um, you know, you caught somebody's eye and, and uh, had just interesting interactions with people there or observed things. And then for Jack, I just wondered if you could say another word about your your store and also if you know of any resources where we could actually like hear bird song in order to um, identify the bird song yeah any any interesting human uh interactions not just the immersive experience of of birds but also of of, of oakland's human life uh if i didn't write it down I don't remember it um, <laughs> it's how it usually works uh, no I'm trying to think uh, I have often got headphones in and I'm trying to avoid people when I go there um, but no you know I mean it, it's very fun at, there's a little duck pond area with a little fence around it and it's always very fun to see how people uh, interact there with the you know it's maybe just mallards and stuff it's you know some of the more common uh, or you know more human friendly birds that hang out there but you know kids throwing it and I don't know if they're supposed to be throwing them bread probably not but they do it and I am um, they seem to be having a lot of fun and it, it's it's nice to see that uh you know sort of uh just joyous interaction between uh, humans and birds is <coughs> one nice one nice thing that happens there whether it's sanctioned or not um um, so the first question was about my store. It's called Wild Birds Unlimited in Novato. Uh, it's part of a continent-wide franchise with over 350 of these stores. We provide things for attracting birds to your backyard and also supplies for birders such as field guides and binoculars. There are some similar stores in the East Bay and South Bay as, as well. Um, for local birding supplies, I think the best source in Berkeley is uh, Animal Farm has a pretty good bird feeding supply section. Um, so yeah, come come visit us there in Novato. Uh, the question about bird song and how to learn it and what resources are good for hearing recordings. There's really one big player in this sphere is uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So the first stop for most people is the their Merlin Bird ID app, which is free. And it has a nicely curated library of recordings. It also recently was upgraded with an identifying by sound feature. So it can take a recording or just live uh, sounds that you hear and, and identify them. And it works pretty well and, and getting better. Um, if you don't want to access it on your smartphone with a downloaded app, they also have the best just general library, which is their All About Birds website, which has a, a again a curated selection where if you just search for a bird song you just type in mockingbird song or something uh you cannot get a big variety and some recordings will be bad and, and some uh might be not locally specific or not describing what they are very well so i'd look at cornell's all about birds or merlin id app and um i point to a lot of these resources and kind of more practical sides of things in the appendix to my own book as well and i'll say about the merlin app um since this book, since my book came out, people, my friends will text me photos of birds or, you know, what kind of bird is this? And I have no idea, but the Merlin app, and it kind of takes you through a series of questions like, how big is it? 
what color is it, this kind of thing. And so I think they think I'm asking those questions because like through that I'll know, but I just am plugging that into the, <laughs> the app. Um, it is now noon. Um, I thank you so much for coming to join us today. The authors will be signing their books in the East Wind Books Tent in the park at 1215. So we're going to kind of saunter down there. Um, thank you so much. I, I, I want to just conclude with, uh, there's just this great phrase uh, that Jack has that I just want to leave you with, um, which is, if we had no birds in our life and only read about them in stories, we would think them appropriately fantastic character from myths and legends. But our lives are full of birds, so we rarely think of them at all. And I hope today changes that for you, um, as, as, uh, as I know it has for, for as, as observing them has for all of us. And I, I hope that these books reach out to many more people and make them aware of our, um, the fantastic beings living among us. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you.